It's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Mark Fox Powell today. Um, Mark is a research fellow at the uh, Astrobiology Open University Group at the Open University. He did his PhD in astrobiology in Edinburgh, uh, and I think he completed in 2016. Mm -hmm. And then he did a postdoctoral position at uh, St Andrews University. And uh, we were just discussing how Mark started at the Air Force University in February of last year. So uh, hats off to him for what must have been a very uh, turbulent start to, or turbulent and benign at the same time, start to his uh, position there. But it sounds like he's, uh, he's making good progress uh, getting to the lab sometimes. Um, so Mark's research focuses on uh, the icy ocean worlds of places such as Europa and Enceladus. And um, his work focuses on how geochemical or biological evidence in the deep extraterrestrial oceans uh, can be delivered to the surface environment, which obviously would make it far more accessible for us to research. Um, so I think um, I'll hand over to you at this point, Mark, if that's okay with you. And um, as always, if you, if everyone keeps their um, uh, microphones on mute for, for the talk, and then uh, we really welcome you to engage with Mark as much as possible at the end. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Karen, for the introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. So thanks very much for the invitation. Um, it's great to be able to join this this list of speakers, fantastic list of speakers. Um, and thank you to the organizers of this series for kind of keeping us stimulated uh, over the last uh, many months. Um, I've definitely learned a lot from coming to these talks. This will probably be a bit of a departure from um, some of the other talks in the series. There will be microbiology in this talk, I promise you. Um, but uh, there'll also be some planetary science and some um, salt ice geochemistry stuff, which for reasons that will hopefully become clear as we as we move through. Um, so yes, this work, uh, the work I'll be outlining today was kind of primarily done during my postdoc at St. Andrews and, and since, since I've joined the Open University uh, and really trying to understand these en enigmatic and but I think are kind of fascinating and, and very important objects in our solar system. So just to give you kind of a brief uh, flavor of where I'm coming from with all of this stuff, um, uh, it's quite hard for me to, to actually summarize um, my background. I suppose I started off really doing microbiology during my PhD, um, but underpinning everything has been kind of this, this uh, motivation of trying to understand how common or rare life is beyond Earth. And I've addressed this by this mantra up in the top left, this uh, follow the brine. And the reason for that is that concentrated hypersaline aqueous fluids, brines, are stable at low temperatures and um, at low pressures, and therefore really are the most accessible form of water uh, beyond Earth. So they, they, are, they can both uh, preserve evidence of ancient environments that we can't access anymore, such as those that existed on ancient Mars, um, but also they can... They, they can exist within the icy shells of, of worlds in the outer solar system where uh, we're very interested in the deep oceans, but we might not be able to access them. Um, so it's really the brine processes that are a key to, to kind of unravel there. And um, yeah, as I said, I kind of started out by looking, by thinking a lot about, um, uh, from a microbial point of view, sort of the stresses that, uh, that, that might exist within complex brines and how uh, the, the adapt, ad, adaptations that microbes might be forced to, to make to, uh, to eke out an existence in those kinds of environments. But increasingly, I've been thinking about brines um, as a, a means of transporting and preserving evidence of life and of uh, geochemical processes that may be accessible to spacecraft. And um, I've kind of always used this, this uh, fairly, I guess, you could call it interdisciplinary kind of mixed bag approach um, of using combination of lab experiments, uh, field work, and also some, some modeling um, to try and understand spacecraft observations and uh, try and inform and understand spacecraft observations. And it's, it's, um, it's now fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've been lucky enough to work in some, in some great groups at Edinburgh and in St. Andrews and, and now joining the astrobiology group at the OU um, is kind of 
really taking this interdisciplinary aspect to another level because we, here we, we work with um, social scientists and uh, educators and lawyers as well as, as the science team. So it's really kind of an interesting and mix of, of uh, people and a good context to do a lot of this work. So um, I will start by giving you just kind of a brief introduction to these objects that I'm calling the ocean worlds and um, uh, and then kind of move into my research from there. So these are, so we've now kind of come to realize that oceans um, are a relatively common feature uh, of the solar system. So obviously we have the earth, which has a lot of liquid water on its surface, but we also have um, at least five objects in the outer solar system, which have large volumes of liquid water in their interiors. And there's actually probably more um, objects that we could add to this list. Uh, there's a lot of candidate ocean worlds out there as well. So they're kind of, their abundance in this solar system kind of goes to suggest this might be a fairly common feature of the, of the universe generally. Um, these are fairly common objects. Um, when I say that these are confirmed ocean worlds, what I'm really meaning is that we have for, uh, in all cases, strong evidence, they have subsurface liquid water oceans. In many cases, we have multiple lines of evidence. So we really, uh, it's, it's beyond reasonable doubt that we are looking at um, worlds that have underneath their icy surfaces have, have vast oceans of, of liquid water. Uh, but oceans are not all the same. We have quite a, uh, this kind of important difference here that I'm gonna highlight. Um, uh, which is that, um, which is to do with the the kind of interior structure and the size of these objects. So, um, uh, oh, I should mention actually, I'll go back to the last slide just briefly, just to kind of orient yourselves. Um, the the three moons at the top here, all in scale to the Earth: Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. These are Galilean moons of Jupiter, and um, Europa is about the size of our moon. And then we have Titan and Enceladus, which are both moons of Saturn. Um, so. Going back to this, to this, the interior structure, um, we believe that these are experiencing internal heating from tidal interactions with their kind of host planets. And we have these rocky cores formed of silicate material. And on top of that, we have a lot of water and it's in, in the form of ice and liquid. And um, the larger moons like Ganymede, Callisto and Titan represented on the left. This is actually a cutaway diagram of Ganymede at Jupiter but um, this is relevant to these other moons as well. These are planet-sized objects. These are kind of mercury-sized objects. And um, because of their, their, big, their large size, a lot of this water is in the form of high pressure uh, H2O phases that um, are actually denser than liquid and accumulate at this at the kind of core boundary. Um, and in some cases, we might have extremely thick layers of this high pressure ice phase. And the liquid water layer is actually sandwiched between that and, and the overlying um, brittle ice, the kind of ice that we all are very familiar with. That's in contrast to the smaller moons, Europa and Enceladus, where these are not big enough to have to form this high pressure ice. And so there we are, we actually are free for the, the, the liquid layer to interact directly with the silicate core. Um, so that means we can have ongoing hydrothermal water rock interactions. So here's a kind of schematic of um, some of the, what we think is going on at these, at these uh, ocean worlds like Europa and Enceladus. We have tidal heating in the, in the rocky core. We have hydrothermal water rock interaction at the core ocean boundary. And then we have the ice shell on top of that, which is very dynamic um, at, at both of these worlds in different ways. We have uh, lots of ice shell processes going on there and interaction with the ocean. And then there's some surface uh, environment processes as well. And um, what's really interesting is this, is the, the fact that we have water rock interaction in the subsurface could potentially, can potentially be generating a lot of the kind of necessary uh, disequilibria um, for supporting um, microbial life. And, um, so, and, and also contributions from the surface may be part of that story as well. So we have a delivery of reductants from geologic activity in the subsurface and delivery of oxidants from this oxidizing surface environment through this kind of dynamic um, ice shell. And this isn't just kind of speculation. I just wanted to highlight that we actually do have data to support this. Um, this is this plot on the left is uh, from the Cassini mission. Uh, this is an encounter with the plumes of Enceladus, which I'll come back to in a minute um, in more detail, but we're seeing molecular hydrogen emanating from, from Enceladus, from, from its ocean. 
Uh, so this is a good indication that we have ongoing hydrothermal input of, of hydrogen into the ocean there. And that is actually generating some really interesting chemistry. So we have reduction of CO2, we have uh, synthesis of organics. These are, uh, these are fragments of a larger organic molecule that has broken down on impact into the, into the mass spectrometer in Cassini. Um, so there's some really interesting uh, chemistry going on within Enceladus's ocean. And also on the oxidant side of the equation, um, this is a map of Europa's surface here, and uh, there's a lot of radiolytic chemistry going on in the surface here. And what you're seeing color coded is just the abundance of, of sulfuric acid on the surface, which is thought to be a product of um, the radiolysis of, of sulfur and, and water ice. And um, because the, the, the ice shells of these worlds, particularly Europa, is so dynamic and so active, um, there, there's an opportunity for this material to make its way into the ocean. And depending on how optimistic you're feeling, um, that could end up being you know, a fairly high flux of oxidants um, that is, is comparable to the Earth's oceans. Um, but uh, uh, so at least some oxidant flux is expected there. So, okay, so we want to learn about these oceans. Hopefully that's given you enough of a sense that, that, that there's some, some interesting questions, some interesting science to be done studying these oceans. They may well have the necessary conditions for extraterrestrial life. Um, be, they may teach us something about prebiotic chemistry. Um, these are interesting high priority targets for exploration in the solar system. But actually studying the oceans is not simple. These things are locked underneath um, tens of kilometers of solid ice and uh, uh, accessing them is, is very, very challenging and, and, and um, something that's not happening in the kind of near term. So we're really left to study here a material on the surface. So this is an image of Europa's, of, of a region of Europa's surface, highlighting this, how dynamic it is. You can see that it's absolutely covered in, in evidence for um, geologic activity. Uh, the, the, the actual surface age of Europa is, is not more than 100 million years. It's a very young surface. Uh, and we have evidence that um, material from the ocean is on the surface. So here's in the bottom left, this classic kind of enigmatic non-ice material correlated with a lot of these, these geologic features. And more recently, uh, observations from the Keck Observatory on Earth, the telescopes in Hawaii have mapped sodium chloride on the surface. And that really, again, that's the blue color here, really correlates with areas we think are the youngest regions. So it looks like that, that um, material from the ocean is indeed being delivered to the surface. And on the other end of the kind of energetic scale, we also have um, these really energetic cryovolcanic plumes that we see at Enceladus. This, this image is just highlighting the, the, the density of, of particulates within the plumes at the South Polar region. Um, and these are, I'll go into more detail in a minute, um, thought to be sourced from the liquid water ocean. So really th this is, this is a, a opportunity to go and sample directly um, or nearly directly uh, an extraterrestrial aqueous environment that currently exists and it's just kind of there waiting for us to sample. Um, so there's two kind of ways we can look at surface materials, we can look at uh, ejected materials in these plumes, um, but in order to actually understand what this is telling us about the ocean and the potential for life in the ocean, we need to be able to understand ice shell processes. So how are fluids transported? What kind of evolution do they go through as they are delivered to the surface environment where our spacecraft are seeing them? So that's kind of the tasks that I, the questions that I, tap, I grapple with in my research that I'm really interested in, in solving. Um, first of all, the provenance of, of ocean derived surface material. So how do things, how does surface material form? What processes um, are contributing to its co the composition that we see? And really underpinning that and, and the kind of driving motivation for doing it really is, is understanding how evidence of microbial life um, in the deep oceans might be preserved in that surface material. And this is actually, I believe is quite important because we're about to enter this kind of new phase of solar system exploration. Um, within a couple of years, we have the launch of the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, which is a European Space Agency mission. And that's gonna go and study the Jupiter system, the moons in the Jupiter system. We have the Europa Clipper NASA mission launching a couple of years later. So we're about to see an absolute revolution in the amount of data, the amount of observational understanding we have of, of, these, of these bodies. So really being able to link what we're seeing on the surface 
to the oceans is, is going to be absolutely key as these missions become active. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about two different projects that I've uh, been involved with and that hopefully will address some of this stuff. Uh, first one, looking at experimental um, work, uh, looking at cryovolcanic plumes of Enceladus, and then we'll move into looking at some field work that I was involved with, looking at analogs for Europa's surface material. And I've got my clock running, so I'll keep an eye on the time. Okay, so first, so this is uh, focused on Saturn's moon Enceladus. So Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It's actually pretty small, it's about 500 kilometers in diameter. Um, and it sits within this really diffuse uh, ring, uh, uh, Saturn, which is a, seen in this amazing backlit image um, from Cassini. Um, that the, it's called the E-ring. And, and Cassini discovered when it arrived at Saturn that Enceladus is in fact the source of the E-ring. And that's because it has these really large um, plumes, really energetic plumes emanating from its south polar region. Um, because Cassini was designed in part to study dust in the Saturn system, it had on board um, a couple of mass spectrometers which were able to actually sample plume material through in a sequence of encounters, close, close flybys of the plume. So on the left is an image from Cassini showing some of these plume structures on Enceladus, and on the right is a, an artist's impression of one of these flybys at a much lower altitude than it actually um, did them. Um, and through these encounters, Cassini has essentially identified three populations of ice grains in the plumes. We have um, some that are formed of, of pure water ice and uh, pure water ice with organics, but then crucially this third type, which is um, called salt rich. Now this, is, this contains uh, high, cons high levels of uh, ions like sodium, chlorine, carbonate, potassium. And um, unlike the first two types, which could form through kind of vapor condensation, this population of grains must be sourced from, from a liquid water reservoir that has experienced um, uh, rock, uh, water rock interaction. So it's, it's thought that this is really a, a sample of that subsurface ocean um, that's being basically thrown out into space, ready to be collected. Um, so, you know, it's really, in my mind, it's quite hard to overstate the significance of these objects. They, they are really uh, tiny frozen samples of, of the ocean. Um, and they're thought to form essentially at the kind of ocean surface within these vent structures. Um, we have probably fairly rapid boiling going on, low pressure boiling, lofting of droplets, which then really rapidly freeze as they are transported up to space, quite an energetic process. Oops. What just happened there? Sorry. Yeah. Um, but the question is, you know, what is actually what kind of evolution do these droplets go through as they experience this rapid freezing? So that's what we kind of set out to, to understand, hopefully understand a bit more about uh, the way that ocean constituents are actually expressed in the plumes. So just a kind of quick primer, I'm sure everyone, um, I'm sure this is very familiar to, to lots of people, uh, but just as, a, as an aqueous fluid, like these kind of salty uh, Enceladus ocean water freezes, um, what typically happens is that we have uh, the formation of ice, uh, which drives the solutes down in, uh, in increasingly concentrated kind of brine veins in interstitial spaces between ice crystals. And as cooling progresses, that leads to the kind of saturation and precipitation of um, uh, a suite of minerals, which um, eventually uh, until if cooling progresses enough, then we have no liquid left. We just have a solid mineral assemblage. Now, if that happens under equilibrium conditions and, and all phases remain in equilibrium throughout, um, the sequence and composition of those phase changes is actually quite straightforward to predict from uh, thermodynamic principles. But um, this kind of rapid freezing at Enceladus that is thought to be occurring uh, here, well, then we have kind of kinetics of, of phase precipitation, things like this become really important for defining what that end member mineral assemblage looks like. Um, and at the moment, those kinds of kinetics are not well, very well understood, not well parameterized in, in predictive models. So they have to be addressed experimentally. So that's what we set out to do. So this is work I did with Claire Cousins at um, St. Andrews. Um, so we uh, started by um, designing a kind of simulated Enceladus ocean. Now this is based on a, a range of observational studies looking at the, the bulk composition of the plume particles taken from Cassini. And what we're looking at here is, a, is an alkaline ocean that is slightly less salty than Earth's oceans, 
lots of carbonate, a bit of ammonium. Um, and there's a kind of uh, a, a constraint on pH that is quite broad. So we, we included both pH 9 and pH 11 to kind of account for that range, very alkaline fluid. What we did is, is froze droplets of, the, of this fluid in, in liquid nitrogen. So this produces a cooling rate of around 10 to 60 Kelvin per second. So these frozen droplets were then mounted on um, microscope stages uh, and sectioned open. Um, and then we were able to analyze the kind of cut face using cryo scanning electron microscopy. Um, so this technique, as well as giving us kind of compositional information, actually allows us to look at um, spatial partitioning within the droplet as well. So here's an example of one of those um, droplets. You're looking down at the cross section here. The white region in the kind of upper right hand corner is the surface of the droplet. So it's kind of not a completely clean cut through. But you can see looking down on it that there's some structure um, in the interior of the droplet. And um, here's a closer look at that structure. So even at these really rapid cooling rates, we have uh, Partitioning, we have the formation of this um, uh, this brine vein network, which which I kind of mentioned earlier, from that the, is known to form through freezing. The dark material here is ice, and then this light material is this um, solute rich brine that's been excluded to ice grain boundaries. What we did is actually sublimated away some of the ice, and that reveals the structure of this brine vein network in a lot more detail. And um, it's, uh, we were able to calculate that it, it occupies around about 5% of the droplet volume. So that means the solutes in there have been concentrated to about 20 times their original concentration and are now oversaturated with respect to kind of several minerals that are expected to form in the system. Looking even closer at it, though, um, we see that it's non-crystalline. It's this kind of smooth glass-like material that has these uh, voids distributed evenly throughout, which are very, very um, evocative of gas bubbles. So this is kind of strongly indicating that this material has vitrified. So this has gone through a glass transition rather than crystallizing. Um, this is kind of unexpected because pure water or dilute fluids like this brine, actually, um, uh, to get them to vitrify in bulk, um, you need cooling rates that are way faster than anything we achieved in our experiments. So um, the thing is, though, as ice has formed and that brine vein network has been established, we've concentrated that fluid down and, and the availability and, and high levels of solutes like this allow vitrification to occur at much, much slower cooling rates. Um, so basically, the conditions within those brine veins become very favorable for vitrification uh, as, as they get concentrated. Uh, what have I done? I keep doing that. Um, so essentially what we have from this flash freezing process is a two-phase product. We have about 95% water ice and about 5% this aqueous glass. And this is potentially really significant for understanding uh, preservation of, of, of uh, microbial biomass somewhere like Enceladus because um, vitrification is, is frequently employed in labs on Earth as a means of perfectly preserving biological structure. So it could be um, that Enceladus is actually serving us up with a perfect mechanism for preserving um, evidence of, of, of microbial life in the subsurface. So we also found that crystalline salts can form um, as well as this glass. Uh, that happens if fluids are rewarmed. So this is a video I'm gonna play. And uh, this is an optical microscope image. You can see a brine vein in the center here, which has uh, gone through this super cooling. There's no crystal, no crystalline salts there. But as you warm it up gradually, well below the temperature the ice begins to form, you see this yellow orange crystal mass sort of propagate through the, through the brine vein. So crystalline salts are forming there. And if you haven't, didn't see that video, there's some stills here that show how before I, well below the temperature of ice melting, we have crystallization. So we can look at partitioning within that crystal, uh, the crystalline material itself. So now we're looking at the sub brine vein scale. And um, we're looking at the kind of crystalline material partitioning within the brine veins. Um, and we did this by extracting this material via uh, full sublimation. So we got rid of all of the ice through sublimation and we we're left behind with just this kind of salt skeleton, as you can think about it, uh, from the droplet. So under flash freezing conditions, this material, again, it's been rewarmed from glass and has crystallized. Um, it's, uh, it's got this homogeneous distribution at the 10 micron scale. 
That's in um, contrast to this control experiment, which is called at much slower cooling rate, about 0 0.01 Kelvin per second, which has formed these kind of linear repetitive structures that are really heterogeneous at the 10 micron scale. And um, kind of used some uh, thermodynamic modeling to try and, and tease apart and understand what's going on here. So what we can kind of infer if we compare the observations to the model is that essentially what we get first is this is this brine vein network established, ice forms, and kind of alongside that we, we precipitate amorphous silica. This forms as colloids, which are likely just a suspension within the brine veins at this point. As cooling progresses, the next phase to form are these sodium carbonates. Now these were identified um, in our experimental samples as these this population of really, really small crystals labeled here. Um, so these obviously these are also likely just a slurry, kind of a suspension within, within the brine veins as cooling progresses. And it's not until later in the sequence, near the, the kind of final stages of freezing, we get chlorides like sodium chloride forming. These force their way through these crystal slurries and, and, and kind of aggregate the whole system. So that this is really a signature of, of these minerals forming in sequence and being able to spatially reorganize themselves. By contrast, in the flash frozen samples, uh, again, we have a brine vein network established. That was, uh, we saw that um, uh, in the SEM images. Uh, we have the inhibition of crystallization. And then what happens subsequently is really um, down to the, the, the subsequent thermal environment that these samples experience. If, they, if rapid cooling is sustained, then we can get vitrification and glass formation. But if rewarming happens, then we, we can form these, um, these crystalline salts, which are uh, all forming kind of more simultaneously and without the spatial reorganization we saw before. So they end up with this homogeneous texture. We also looked at the bulk mineralogy of the particles um, and of the, of, the min of, the, of the salts formed through these two routes and found that there are pH dependent differences and also some, some, some signatures of the, of the flash freezing, uh, some kinetic inhibition of certain minerals, particularly in the carbonates, but I kind of won't labor on, on that point. To kind of summarize that, that study really we had, um, we found that there were kind of two end member uh, products of cryovolcanism. We either could have ice templated glass within the particle, or we could have salt minerals forming within those brine veins, again, templated by, these, by ice crystal formation. In the latter case, that can form through either kind of simultaneous crystallization um, through the rewarming of previously flash frozen fluids, or it can form through kind of gradual crystallization in sequence. And these two routes have both a textural and a compositional record of their formation. So we should be able to use mineralogy and, and texture to be able to infer some of these dynamics indirectly. Okay, I'm gonna just skip that. So then kind of next big question really is what does this mean for um, the capture and incorporation of microbial biomass? And this is, the, the kind of subject of, of ongoing research here at, at the Open University. Um, and really the kind of the, the more technical question we might be interested in is here is what phase in this system does microbial biomass associate with? Because that question, answering that is gonna be very important for understanding kind of the mass spectrometry data we get back from missions that can capture these, these um, particles. So we can kind of turn to previous work that I was involved with um, to, tr to begin to answer this question. So this is work uh, done while I was at St. Andrews um, in collaboration with Alan Channing at, at Cardiff and, and Ed Clutis' group in, in uh, Winnipeg and Louis de Preston. Um, and we basically, we were, we were motivated here to understand um, the, the capture of microorganisms in, in silica rich fluids. So we were able here to use uh, a very simplified brine, unlike the kind of complex complex brine in the Enceladus fluids, which have multiple components here, really strip the system down to just considering just one inorganic phase, this is amorphous silica. And again, this precipitates in a very similar way uh, within brine vein networks within ice. And the image of one of these lattice structures that's formed through that process is seen in the upper right. Um, this is the ice here has been melted and removed and is just left with this lattice. And we did quite a simple experiment where we took four pure strains that were really phylogenetically separated and um, morphologically distinct from each other, and also some, some natural fluids from, from the Strucker uh, hydrothermal system in Iceland, um, uh, and basically froze them in the presence of this silica-rich fluid. And what we found is that um, 
these particles. So the two top two left images are the, you can see the, the morphology of these silica particles that form within ice, the ice grain boundaries. These are quite efficient at capturing um, evidence of, of microorganisms. But the kind of the main finding here is that most of the strains we looked at were uh, sandwiched essentially at the surface of these particles. So these are really being excluded preferentially from both the ice as it forms and from the aggregating uh, precipitating inorganic phase, the, the, opali the opaline silica. So they're being excluded and trapped at the kind of interface between the two. Um, and that, that was true for pure strains as well as the environmental samples, which you can see along the, the bottom three images. But that wasn't the kind of the full story. We also had, um, we also found that this filamentous cyanobacteria, um, this chloroflexus strain, was never uh, found at the surface of the particles. It was only ever detected within particles. We, could, we, we had to turn to other micros microscopic techniques like optical microscopy, fluorescence microscopy to visualize it. And this is actually supported by Raman spectroscopy we did, which is very much a surface technique. And um, you're seeing with the kind of chloroflexus samples, we, we, we really didn't see much, um, despite the fact that it has these very Raman active pigments. And that's in contrast to this, to this um, rhodocinomonas strain at the bottom here, which was present at the surface of the particles and did have this really strong Raman response. So there's a kind of complex story here where um, uh, most strains seem to be preferentially excluded uh, from precipitating phases, but others seem to actually co-precipitate with um, some of the earlier phases in the sequence. So when we actually think about more complex brines, such as these Enceladus fluids, it really raises the question of, you know, whether there is going to be a generalizable universal answer to the kind of fate of biomass here, or whether it really is down to kind of um, uh, interactions between precipitating minerals and, and, and the, the uh, organisms themselves. So that's kind of the, the, the um, focus of ongoing work. In this paper, we also looked a lot at, um, uh, we did some mission relevant measurements using FTIR and, and uh, near infrared spectroscopy and things like this. If you're interested in that, um, feel free to ask me about it or we can um, or, or check out the paper in EPSL 2018. Okay, so the time is half past, got a little bit of time left. Um, going to now move on to uh, talk a bit about natural analogs for Europa's surface. Uh, so this is work done sort of primarily in, in collaboration with um, Western, the University of Western Ontario, but also has involved a huge number of other people, um, which I will try my best to kind of um, uh, credit as we go through. Um, but this is kind of ongoing and, and, and these systems that I'm going to describe are are really interesting and kind of spawning a lot of different uh, spin-off work. Um, so this is really motivated by, you know, in planetary science we, and as astrobiology, we do a lot of analog work on Earth because we can actually test out some of our theories and, and generate kind of new understanding just by studying similar environments on Earth. This has been really, really useful for Mars exploration, but um, is much more of a challenge when we think about these ocean worlds because so the Earth is a very different place to, to Europa, for example. Um, it's quite challenged to find locations on Earth that uh, have analogous properties, but we think we found a fairly compelling one. So this is Axel Heiberg Island. It's, um, it's a, in the Canadian high Arctic. Absolutely amazing, um, just unspoiled, beautiful place. Um, fantastic uh, island. And here it is, colored red, up in the Arctic Circle um, in northern Canada. Uh, to give you a kind of background as to why Axel Heiberg was, was interesting to us. Uh, this is a kind of stratigra stratigraphic representation of the region. There's no need to kind of dive into the detail here. The only thing really to notice is the, are these red blobs. These are evaporite diapirs, which are popping up all over the region, including on Axel Heiberg. And in this image behind, um, there's, you can see one quite clearly. It's this white blob in the background. Um, Axel Heiberg actually has the highest concentration of exposed evaporite diapirs um, on Earth outside of Iran, I believe. Um, and it's the only location on Earth where you get the conjunction of, of evaporites of this, of this scale and um, permafrost. So we have about 400, 500 meters of permafrost on Axel Heiberg. And it's the combination of the salts. Um, these diapirs are formed of um, gypsum, halite, anhydrite. 
uh, the remnants of an ancient Carboniferous ocean. It's the combination of the salts and the permafrost that drive the formation of these really unique um, cold saline springs. So this is an example of one. This is Lost Hammer Spring. All of that white material is salt. Um, it's not snow or ice. And that's me um, in the blue top, kind of in the main vent structure there, um, sampling it. So these are formed by the upwelling of anoxic fluids. that are really saline. They are um, about 28% salts, high levels of dissolved sulfates. And they're also uh, very, very stable temperatures all year round. Um, so this, the kind of uh, bottom line on this plot shows the Arctic air temperature, which gets as low as kind of minus 40 C in the winter, but the, the spring temperatures remain constant and they, they resist freezing because of these high levels of, of salt. Um, and the salts themselves are kind of what caught our attention initially. These are um, polyhydrated sulfates and chlorides, um, things that, uh, that, have, that are very much low temperature phases and um, are implicated in, have been implicated repeatedly in, in remote sensing data as major components of Europa non-icy material. So this is material that is again thought to originate from the ocean and is kind of our best shot at kind of studying Europa's ocean um, in the near term. So that kind of is, is, was our motivation for visiting these springs. So how do they form? Well, it's thought that they form through meteoric water um, infiltrating below the permafrost, uh, it's buffered then temperature-wise by the permafrost and, and dissolves a whole load of those evaporites from the subsurface before delivering them back to the surface. And, and we have some hydrogen oxygen isotope data that um, supports that interpretation. And the, the, water, the, but the springs, these colored symbols fall on the meteoric water line here, which just indicates that they are meteoric, but that um, uh, contemporary potential sources like snow melt from, from uh, regionally nearby to springs is actually clearly from different, a different reservoir of, of water than the spring itself. So there's clearly a kind of disconnect and, and a long uh, uh, and some separation in terms of time in, uh, for um, uh, the water as it infiltrates below and, and seeps up. So we have, we have support for this kind of interpretation that these, these are, there's a kind of complex recharge system going on here. So I was lucky enough to visit these springs in July 2017. Um, this is, uh, I went with, with Gordon Nazinski and his group uh, from University of Western Ontario. And um, we, we basically sampled three of the spring systems on the island and they're on, represented on the map here. You can see in the background, a image of our camp at Lost Hammer Spring. And Lost Hammer is, the, is this kind of smudge of white on the landscape in the middle distance. Um, you've seen it before. This is just another view of the spring. Uh, it has a, um, a single vent uh, where, the, where the brine is emerging. This is moderately acidic brine, about minus four degrees C. It's anoxic and has high, high levels of reduced sulfur. And um, also it's been shown previously that, that there's a, a lot of gases discharging here. We have methane, we have sulfide, we have carbon dioxide. Um, and uh, this, this salt deposit here is um, primarily formed of these, these again, polyhydrated uh, sulfate and chloride salts. These are really common in sea ice, actually, these minerals, but finding them in large scale deposits like this on the surface is really uncommon on, on Earth. Um, I'm just gonna quickly outline a couple of the, the, two other, the other two springs that we visited, um, so you get an idea of how different they are. This is Color Peak. Um, it's, uh, really different. It has multiple spring sources. Uh, it has these dark green mineral terraces, which are formed of calcite and gypsum. Um, here, the pH is, is uh, a little bit higher. We have higher temperatures. We have still really high levels of, of reduced sulfur. And um, uh, been involved in, in some work led by Michael Macy here at the Open University, uh, looking at the microbiology of this, of this site and, and um, showing some really interesting um, conclusions about, about what, what we can say about the about metabolism that were viable on, on ancient Mars by, by studying the kind of sulfur cycling and microorganisms within this, these springs. The third site we visited was uh, Stoltz Spring. This is just kind of on a different scale to the other two. And this is a, like a kilometer scale salt deposit that fills a kind of ravine on the side of one of these diapers. Um, you can get a sense of the scale in the bottom right-hand corner. That's Mike, one of our one of the field teams, stood on the salt deposit 
here. Um, so it's absolutely enormous uh, deposit. It's, it's again, um, quite low temperature and it's formed here primarily of hydrated chloride. So this is again, compositionally distinct from the, from the other two in terms of the salt mineralogy. So what we did is we took samples of this, uh, of the, all the salts from these springs back to the lab and um, measured their uh, measured near infrared reflectance spectroscopy at a range of temperatures. And this was to compare directly with data from, from, from Europa. Um, so we, we processed that data and um, to, to kind of emulate the instruments on the Galileo spacecraft, which is the one that was uh, active at Europa or in the Jupiter system in the kind of late 90s, early 2000s. And data from Galileo is actually represented on the bottom of the right-hand plot in the, with the black line here. Um, and also some upcoming instruments on upcoming missions. Really the only thing to, to note here is that um, the Lost Hammer Spring uh, really does a very good job at, at, at kind of recreating the, the spectral, the main spectral features of, of the Europa non-icy material, including kind of the band geometries here and the band minimum positions and, and a whole lot of, kind of spectral features. So what we're looking at here is a really good spectral analog for uh, Europa surface salts. So it's kind of worth now understanding a bit about how this forms in its natural environment. So here's just a representation of some of the major features of the brine chemistry and the salt mineralogy. We have um, on the right-hand side, uh, the mineral compositions. Don't need to worry about what the specific minerals are, but it's worth just pointing out that, you know, these are the three springs. You can see just by eye that they're qualitatively very different from each other. Um, at Lost Hammer, we have the, this red bar and this peach colored bar. These are sodium sulfate minerals. Um, but the brine, as you can see on the left-hand side here, is, um, is very rich. It, is, it still has, its chloride still dominates over sulfate by a couple of orders of magnitude. So we're forming a sulfate dominated deposit here from a chloride dominated fluid. Um, so what's, we, to kind of understand how that, how that works in its formation history, we did some thermodynamic modeling. Um, this is using the code FreezeChem uh, written by Giles Marion. And basically showing that the, the deposit here is a kind of snapshot in the evolution of the fluids, not a representation of the end member um, um, evaporite that would form. This is really important if we think about, we, we wanna go to a moon like Europa and all we see is this deposit. Uh, we need to be able to account for, you know, what portion of the, um, of the sequence of, of formation are we seeing here? Um, and um, uh, it's really a question of transport. You know, the, a lot of the other, the chlorides here are being transported away and we're not seeing them. And so I'm kind of working now on, on, on developing this and really extrapolating it to Europa directly. Um, this is a, these are a whole range of different um, model oceans with varying sulfate concentrations. And we can see how um, this basically just a representation of, of depth on the y-axis. And, and some of these oceans lose a lot of their sulfate very deep in the ice shell and, and, and not very efficient at transporting sulfates into the shallower regions of the ice where they might have a, a, a chance of kind of reaching the surface environment. So kind of establishing this analog and uh, showing how kind of useful it is for understanding uh, the formation of Europa's surface material. Now kind of the question is, is um, uh, what aspects of the kind of biogeochemistry in this system might we expect to be able to detect in, in the salts and, and, and left behind in the deposits? So uh, this is Arola moreras Marti, who's a postdoc in St. Andrews. She's been doing some fantastic work looking at um, sulfur biogeochemistry. So these systems are known to be dominated by sulfur cycling organisms. And um, evidence for that can be seen in, um, in the precipitates that are formed. So uh, Arola uh, basically extracted the sulfates and sulfides from, the, from three different locations on the Lost Hammer Spring. And these represent kind of uh, a gradient of oxidation as we go from the anoxic fluids that are delivered to the surface to the kind of more oxidized downstream locations represented in this kind of upper right hand image. And um, uh, basically what she found is that um, we have these huge fractionations between the between the sulfates and the products of the, the, the potential products of microbial metabolism, the sulfides. And this is really kind of good evidence that we have um, uh, uh, 
these are metabolic products. These are products of microbial sulfate, sulfate metabolism, sulfur metabolism, I should say. Um, also, by looking at uh, other isotopes of sulfur, so the, the, the minor isotopes of sulfur, 33 and 36, we can actually resolve another dimension of, of uh, degree of freedom here and actually start to see that we have evidence that these are um, that the sulfur in this system has been mediated by both sulfate reduction, microbial sulfate reduction, and microbial sulfate disproportionation. Um, and that's supported by um, metagenomic data, functional profiling of the communities here, uh, which is in prep at the moment. Um, so, you know, really strong isotopic, um, what we might call a biosignature here, um, recorded in the, in the fractionation between the substrate, the sulfate, and the, and the product, the, the sulfide. Um, and that's really important when we think about um, future missions like Europa Lander, which is currently in development, uh, that may well be able to measure things like sulfur isotopes. So we, we're doing some ongoing work now, looking at mission relevant ways of recovering sulfur isotope data using techniques that, will, that are being considered for future landed missions. Okay, so I make that 45 minutes. I just wanted to kind of wrap up um, and say that I'm not going to kind of summarize all the science here. I just wanted to kind of uh, a top level summary by saying that, you know, these ocean worlds may contain the largest habitable volumes currently in the solar system. We have extant bodies of liquid water here. Um, ocean derived materials on the surface and in plumes can act as a window into ocean processes. And we can actually go kind of hands on with samples there in a way that you know, is very difficult to do somewhere like Mars, where, where we're often looking at ancient environments that have been exposed to the Martian surface for billions of years. Here we have potentially frozen samples of extant liquid water environments that may have ongoing um, biogeochemistry. And um, so the challenge really is to, is to understand how and to what extent this material, material in plumes, material on the surface of these bodies, actually represents the, the subsurface ocean. And I think there's I want to just say as, as a kind of call to arms, there's plenty of opportunity to, to dive into this stuff. We have two missions coming up. We have more in development to follow onto this. So there's going to be a huge amount of data to kind of get stuck into. Um, another kind of reminder of that, this is the JUICE spacecraft in April 2021 this year. It's finished its assembly. It's on its way to STEC in the Netherlands right now for, for space environment testing prior to its launch next year. We're really at the cusp of a kind of new wave of exploration of these bodies, um, uh, where, as I said, you know, we have ongoing um, processes that are of great interest to hopefully a lot of us as microbiologists, as geochemists. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say, very, I was reminded by Karen actually at the beginning of this talk to, to plug this. Um, we are hosting the third British Planetary Science Conference at the Open University in January next year. Uh, right now, we don't know, don't know the format of this conference. We're, we hope it might be in person, but we, we can't say for sure at this point, obviously. But if you'd like some more updates on that, you can just follow our Twitter handle for the moment, which is on the screen, and there'll be plenty more updates coming as we move through 2021. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. That's brilliant. I absolutely loved your uh, microscopy images. They're always so beautiful to see that sort of thing. And I'm so glad that you got the... Uh, metagenomics slipped in towards the end there because that was going to be one of my, <laughs> my burning questions. Um, so uh, I will open up the floor to the audience for questions as always. Um, unmute your microphone and uh, voice them yourself or if you don't feel comfortable doing that you're also welcome to write in the chat. Um, so yeah just raise your hand if you've got one you want to ask. Um, I'll just give a moment for the enthusiastic first person to come forward. All right. Uh, Rosa is asking, uh, did you test if micros survived the in, uh, inclusion in the interphase or in the inorganic partitioning? Are you asking if, if the question is, um, do they retain viability? Um, that is a really good question. And we didn't test it. And it would be an obvious thing to test. I think particularly it will be relevant um, for the 
the kind of terrestrial implications of, 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 the, of the silica study, where we were looking at the capture of microorganisms within cryogenic silica. Um, so in that, you know, we actually, I'm actually fairly convinced that this process does happen on Earth um, in, high, in hot springs, places like uh, Yellowstone and potentially Iceland, where the temperatures in the winter get low enough. You can actually, we can actually form this kind of cryogenic silica, which unlike the kind of typical sinters that you might see at hot springs made of silica, which are uh, solid precipitates accumulating on the kind of bottom of the spring, these cryogenic silica, which can form in ice, when the ice thaws can be exported and transported away. So this might be, if viability is retained, this could be a mechanism of dispersal um, in hydrothermal environments. So yeah, I, I, I didn't, we didn't do that work, but it is, would be important to do, I think. Um, is that Terence wanting to ask a question? Yeah, go for it, Terence, thanks. Hi, um, thank you. Great Hi, talk, Mark. Um, just a very simple question. I probably should know the answer, so and it kind of precedes the previous one. Thinking of Enceladus, you mentioned that you had um, low pressure boiling prior to the, the rapid freezing. Um, I guess I just want to know what temperature that occurs, which of course has relevance for preservation of life and biomolecules? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It's, it's, it's not very well known. Um, the reason that they think this low pressure boiling is happening is because, uh, because of the, one of the three populations of particles detected were, were these organics, complex organics, macromolecular organics uh, with water ice. And, and they're kind of the explanation for how you can get this particle, it doesn't have any salts in it, so it's not a droplet of liquid that's frozen, is that you have something akin to the sea surface microlayer. So there's a layer of, of insoluble organic material accumulated at the surface, and through bubble bursting, you're lofting particles of this up, and that then condense water vapor and, and on their way up to space. Um, so, and that kind of matches up with, with some of the physical modeling of, of how these cracks change and, and widen and, and close through Saturn, the orbit around Saturn and things um, that we get the, these kind of extreme pressure gradients within the cracks. But to, it's a long way of answering your question. Basically, we don't really know. There are some, there are some bands on pressure. Temperature is always kind of assumed to be somewhere near zero degrees C at the surface of the, of the, of the liquid. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you very much. Um, so a question here about um, focusing more on the microbiology. Um, Femi wanted to ask if the um, if your group were able to culture some interesting microbes from the lost hammer samples, other than the metagenomic data, um, obviously be really interesting from the physiological and metabolic properties. Yeah, it, it's again, it's a crucial thing that we, we we have been trying to do, and I know that they had success here at the Open University culturing from uh, Color Peak, um, mm -hmm. Color Peak being one of the other three springs, uh, they're getting a lot of sulfide oxidizers um, in culture. And um, uh, from Lost Hammer, it's been much more challenging. I believe there have been some aerobic heterotrophic success along those lines. Um, but what we see in the kind of metagenomes and, and also previous work looking at kind of 16S sequences and stuff is that this system is dominated by sulfur cycling organisms, sulfate reducers, sulfide oxidizers, and actually getting those in culture from Lost Hammer has been really challenging. Um, so yeah, it's ongoing at the moment. Uh, along the same, same lines of, on obtaining samples, do you have any uh, hunch on what is it that makes uh, certain microorganisms co-precipitate and others be excluded from those? Uh... Um, again, it, it, it could be pure speculation. It's just pure speculation, really, at this point. But, you know, we have cell wall properties are quite different between the strains we use. And, and chlorofle the chloroflexus strain in particular has, has a very established cell wall uh, in contrast to the other strains. So there could well be some kind of um, molecular scale interaction going on there during the precipitation uh, that, that will be key to unravel. And, and in fact, that might not just be specific to the organism, it'll probably also be specific to the inorganic phase as well. So this is gonna be a very complex story to unpick. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be some surface interaction process, I think. Uh, and in the chat, Karen is uh, 
offering knowledge about isolates from Colour Peak. Yeah. Think. Great. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, feel free to raise your hand on mute and uh, ask away. Um, I, I have a, another quick question. About, at the start, you said, depending on, uh, I think you said something like, depending on how optimistic uh, you were, you might have uh, oxygen fluxes similar to our oceans. How optimistic are you? Um. <laughs> not that optimistic okay. um, i think <laughs> i mean that pa that paper that i uh, um i don't know if anyone here is familiar with it but it, they essentially make the argument in that paper that you could you could support mammals you know you could have you could have or, or uh, sorry i don't mean mammals large multicellular organisms like sharks and things we're using with the amount of oxygen flux they calculate mm -hmm. but i think i think we just don't know enough about the the geological processes within the ice shell. There's gonna be a lot of um, uh, potential sinks of oxidants um, before you even get to the ocean, um, particularly if there's ocean fluids uh, within the ice shell itself, which there absolutely seem to be. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of sinks of, of oxidants there before it makes its way to the, to the, um, to the ocean. And, and it's, again, that paper assumes an efficient, uh, almost perfect efficiency of transfer over time. Mm -hmm. Whereas I don't think you know, the ice shell's probably not absolutely efficiently overturning itself hundred, every hundred million years, like the way that they assume. So I think, yeah, I think there is an oxidant flux, but it's probably a fair bit lower than the, the upper bound they calculate. Okay, brilliant, thanks. Um, well, whilst people are thinking of any final questions, I'll just let everyone know that our next seminar is in two weeks, uh, May 13th at the same time as today, and we've got Christina Cato talking about biofilms and building stone biodegradation. So very different topic, but uh, hopefully extremely interesting, like all our speakers. Um, any final questions from the audience? I'll give you a quick moment to jump up and down with excitement. I think everyone just enjoyed. You've got um, a few uh, really nice comments from people congratulating you on the talk, saying it's fascinating, brilliant, exciting, excellent, all great words. <laughs> Thanks, so, everybody. Yeah, I think uh, it's a good place to leave it then. And um, once again, thank you so much, Mark, for giving up your lunchtime to, uh, to speak to us. Really fascinating work. Thanks. No problem. Thank you very much. Okay. Karen and everybody. <laughs>